Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's David M. Scott, um, and uh, I'm Vice President of the Australian Society of Anaesthetists for a little while longer. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to day three of the Congress. Uh, I have a few housekeeping announcements to make. Um, for maximum interaction, I am to encourage attendees to download the Congress app. Anyone in here who has a smartphone who hasn't downloaded the Congress app yet, go ahead and do it. It's worth it. It's a good way of keeping track of what's going on. Um, and whilst you're doing that, could you please set your phones to silent? Uh, and uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr Guy Christie Taylor, who will be delivering the Jeffrey K oration today. Uh, Guy, I consider as a good friend. Um, he is the current president of our society and has been an outstanding member of our professional issues advisory committee for, for quite a while. Uh, he's previously been chair of the South Australian Northern Territory Committee of Management. He works as a full-time staff specialist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, he's on the executive uh, committee member of the CVP SIG and as a principal site investigator of the ATACAS trial. I was, I was uh, encouraged by uh, uh, a person in the audience to make a bit of ad lib about Guy and um, make a few uh, comments about him, but I've been really impressed over the last two years of, of following around in his shadow uh, as what a, a great thinker and a careful thinker that Guy is. I think he's shown excellent leadership uh, of the ASA and I hope if I'm half as good as him, I'll do a, a pretty damn good job. So I'd ask you to welcome Dr Guy Christie Taylor. Uh, thank you very much, David. That's um, very flattering. Jeffrey Kay was arguably the most influential anaesthetist in Australia. So wrote Rod Westhorpe. He helped start the Australian Society of Anaesthetists in 1934, was instrumental in founding the Faculty of Anaesthetists of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons in 1952. So we could just leave the discussion there, really. He was a good man. He was our founder, and we have an oration in his honor. But I think it's far more interesting and a lot more compelling <clears throat> to examine why he was the subject of wounding remarks, why 49 failed, and why he ultimately withdrew from the anesthetic community. And so it just drops down a whole page full of questions does an examination of this man and his relationship to the specialty cast some light on the culture of not only our society but that of our specialty? Does an examination of our origins in which he played such a central role help us to understand our present state and to empower us to deal more effectively with our current challenges? What do we mean when we talk about the culture of an organization? What are the current determinants of our culture? Do we grasp the destructive potential, potentially, of a wrong culture? Does leadership determine culture? Does culture eat strategy for breakfast? And can we fix culture? Does our culture contain the seeds of our own destruction? Or is it our culture that has and will continue to sustain us? So I thought we might embark, and there they are, a huge number of questions. I thought we might embark on a small cultural journey, beginning in Drummond Street in Carlton, a fairly modest home. You can go and look it up on realestate.com to discover that it sold for about $960,000 a few years ago. And it was inhabited by this man, another David, David Adam Brown and his good Australian-born wife, Mary Elizabeth. 
who were actually married in the Clarendon Street Presbyterian Church. Now, Clarendon Street's just really outside the door. And I couldn't find the Presbyterian Church in Clarendon Street, so I presume it's been bulldozed and become the Crown Casino or possibly even this convention center. So it's really right under our feet. And they were married in South Melbourne, here in South Melbourne, on April the 7th in 1893. And it's probably relevant to note that just two years prior to this, in May 1891, a young man of 32 died during chloroform administration at the Melbourne Hospital, the precursor of the Royal Melbourne. And at that time, just a 10-bed, two-story cottage hospital on Lonsdale and Swanston Streets. And at the inquest, the city coroner declared that an expert should supervise chloroform administration. It appeared to him the cases of death under chloroform occurred all too frequently at the Melbourne Hospital, and students were allowed to give chloroform without any supervision, and the wonder was not that deaths should occasionally occur, but they didn't happen more frequently. And it is also appropriate to note that in 1891, the boom that had driven Melbourne for so many years finally crashed and burned in a spectacular crash. Banks and businesses failed, large numbers, thousands of shareholders lost their money, tens of thousands of workers were out of work, and in fact there was estimated to be 20% unemployment in Melbourne at that time. So David married in 1893, just two years after this event. And it's equally important to note that many people left and emigrated, as you might anticipate, to the gold fields of Western Australia and of South Africa. So here's a photograph of his, of his best friend, James Christie. And you can see that it was taken in Elgin Street. And I walked down there, and I suspect many of you drive along Elgin Street, and you might even own the property in Drummond Street, I'm not sure. But it was probably taken somewhere in those uh, block of, um, that row of shops. And so what is it that, uh, David Adam and his good friend James Christie have in common, apart from really impressive moustaches? Well, that's what they have in common. He's also got an impressive moustache, um, grown for a good reason in November, when a good friend and colleague of mine's father had prostate cancer. And uh, I think my wife continues to make a donation to November in the hope that I'll never grow another one. So, in fact, they were my great-grandfathers, uh, both Scottish immigrants. And I guess the challenge is, well, where, the, where did you get your strange accent? And I guess it challenges you to ask, well, am I a Scottish Presbyterian Victorian, or am I an Anglican South African South Australian? So what am I really? What is the cultural mix that has determined what I fundamentally believe in and who I am? And I would challenge you to consider that for yourself individually as we wander further. So if we take an hour and a half stroll, we go to a much posher part of town. And this is it, 49 Mathura Road in Turak. I'm not sure if you know the cardiologist or the orthopedic surgeon who currently lives there. But it was built in 1888, just before the boom, and it was clearly built to the very highest specifications and has, as the um, website, as um, realestate.com would say, it has been meticulously restored within its original footprint, and it looks like that, Beswick. And it looks like that, you could house a family in the corridor. And in fact, it was inhabited and owned in 1951 by this man. And if things had worked out, we could have in fact had our own Ali Maroa we could have had our Beswick. But it unfortunately wasn't to be. And I guess we've got to ask ourselves why. And this is rather beautifully chronicled in a series of letters that Geoffrey Kay wrote. And in these articles recently from Anesthesiology and, and in a similar article, and I like this one in particular because it has a fantastic quote from Francis McMeachin, which I just thought we had to read. We couldn't go past it. 
It is certainly challenging to realize that the whole structure of modern surgery, a great part of medical practice and most lab research, would go crashing into the abyss of oblivion if anesthesia were to be blotted from the world. So, what exactly happened at 49 Mathura Road? And what did 49 Mathura Road represent? Well, at the heart of 49 was anesthesia's recognition as a specialty for Jeffrey Kay hoped that his work would increase the status of anaesthetists and promote acceptance of anaesthetics as a specialty, one that would be characterized by departments of anaesthesia distinct from surgery, the salaried university faculty conducting clinical research at affiliated hospitals. And he hoped that Australian anaesthesia would gain international prominence by incorporating the elements of clinical anaesthesia practiced in the United Kingdom and the anaesthesia research seen in the United States states. And one of his long-term goals was to build a huge diffusion centre of scientific and technical information for the Australian Society. It would house a library and museum and meeting spaces and apparatus, a journal of the highest calibre, machinery and lab facilities. And when in 1951 the plans for the faculty were approved, Kay established the Society's Centre of Excellence at 49 Mathura Road in Melbourne. But what about the society? It probably likely viewed it as more of a stable place, really, for its records and its secretariat, museum and library. And by 1955, the promise of 49 had failed. The mutual misunderstanding of the goals of 49 may be partly explained by the ASA's failure to state its intent for the centre at the outset. The argument has been put that the ASA was too small, only five years removed from its rebirth after the war to sustain this grand vision for the centre. It was a period of transition for the specialty with few qualified members and only the early beginnings of salary departments. And Kay blamed <coughs> the failure of 49 on a lack of support from the ASA and its membership. And Kay's attitude was that one should work, that, that, that the work required to maintain the center and fulfill its mandate should have been done as a matter of obligation, interest and pride by members of the society. And it may well be that he failed to simply understand the situation of the ordinary, ordinary anaesthetist. Practicing physicians in difficult economic times were trying to make their way in a new environment with young families to support, and I might add they were probably inhabiting the likes of Drummond Street more than Mathura Road. And he wrote in exasperation, how does one get members of the society to work? We've given them every amenity. All they want is a monthly meeting. And if someone else gets it up for them, the older men are tired, tired, overtaxed, the younger men are cynical, and their attitude is summed up by the naval adage, blast you, Jack, I'm on the raft, or in more modern parlance, bugger you, mate, I'm off. Till they, till they work for their society, they won't really value it, and how does one induce them to begin working? And he really went on to lament. The Australian society reminded me very much of what I saw at Petra, a stupendous facade, with nothing very much behind it. Very bitter words. So, what did the members do? Well, if I was a member, I would certainly have shown visitors to 49, but the members didn't use it. They attended regular meetings at the facility, but only if others managed the logistics. The members were not interested in making use of the dark room or the workshop, or assisting in the duplication and distribution of the newsletter, or keeping the grounds in order. Nothing could be further from their thoughts. And he went on to say, the whole show is thrown back upon individuals and mighty few of them for this lamentable state of things. I do not blame entirely the apathy. It's all part of what we might call the tyranny of the private case. Our fellows live by private practice. And, they, <clears throat> and he went on to say, and dare not miss a case, lest they forfeit their surgeon's goodwill and patronage for the future. Hence, the most sacred obligations are at the mercy of the surgeon's telephone call. One can see the hopes of better times only when in some form of national medical service which by relieving anaesthetists from economic insecurity might set them free 
to follow their own bent on occasions. Such a service can easily be brought in this country by the turn of the political wheel. I was amusingly naive to suppose that if one gave chaps facilities, they'd want to use them, and my American friends warned me of what might happen, but I wouldn't listen. They can chant in unison, like so many black crows, those blessed words, we told you so, the joke is on me. And in the same letter, Kay in part blames his anesthetic colleagues, declaring certainly those who entered the specialty, entered the war, were a pedestrian lot, not terribly flattering, looking for an easier life than in other forms of medical practice. And although he did express some level of understanding about the plight of the practicing anesthetist, we do not know if that translated into actions consistent with that understanding. And further, even if Kay was wholly sympathetic with their troubles, the perception that he was not sympathetic contributed to the failure. So, Kay's faults can be in part attributed to his deep and binding love of what 49 could have meant to the Australian anaesthesia community. He felt he was gambling in anaesthesia's future for very heavy stakes. He took the failure as a personal one and he withdrew from the anaesthesia community. In fact, he carried the anger for many years, and in correspondence in 1981 with Gwen Wilson, he, Gwen Wilson suggested that Kay took it too personally, and he objected by thunder it was, and not without reason. And in the same letter in 1981, Kay recounts decades-old slights. I was the subject of wounding remarks. One was an accusation of election rigging, another accusation that hurt that I was trying to make myself the director, and indeed Kay recounts the comments from the society's president that 49 was my hobby, as his was gardening. And he also noted, the nub lies in your remark about personalization. If we may use a, a noun so barbaric, had the ASA of 1950 to 55 been made up of Dallies or McCalls, the scheme would have worked. We do not know if the idea of 49 had an effect on the subsequent success of Australian anaesthesia. Wilson seems to think so, writing in a letter to Kay, and really, in some ways, ironically, that the failure of the project had an effect of cementing the society, or perhaps its most enduring legacy is the estrangement of Kay. We can only speculate how that may have helped or hindered the development of anaesthesia in Australia. So Walter Mushen, he was writing in an essay on anesthesia's history, states, it is not enough to rake over the ashes of the past or to examine in ever increasing detail the lives of our pioneers unless we can extract from the process a greater understanding of our present day problems and so a greater likelihood of solving them. Between the two world wars, interest in anesthesia was confined to a mere handful of men who had to stand up to what almost amounted to the contempt of their colleagues because they were still widely held everywhere in Europe and in the United States that anesthesia was an occupation that hardly demanded a medical education. And we actually owe a debt to Rupert Hornibrook, who many years before, in 1914, had the sense or the gumption or the gall, or just it was clearly evident to him, and he wrote that one of the greatest difficulties the teacher has to contend with is the inborn idea that any fool can administer anesthetic. And he related the remark to us to a senior Melbourne surgeon that a dray man could administer chloroform. And in fairness to Geoffrey Kay, when he was looking for advice in 1927, a surgeon at the Alfred said, why well, waste your opportunities? He recalled that anaesthetics was poorly regarded as a specialty the province of the physically handicapped or those who'd failed in other branches of medicine. The surgeons of the day found that the best anaesthetists were the medical orderlies because those blokes did as they were told. So the first years of the society were difficult times. non anaesthetists did not appreciate the necessity of a separate society. The BMA didn't take kindly to the establishment of a group in opposition to the state sections of anaesthetics, and the members of the executive were idealistic in their expectations of the society. And the general members struggled to make a living. Nevertheless, Kay's dogged efforts as secretary ensured that the society survived. 
So, might we attribute the outcome to Kay's failure to grasp the prevailing organizational culture of the ASA at the time, at the time of this early emerging specialty? Is organizational culture different today? Do we even have the slightest grasp on what our culture might be? And really, what do we mean by organizational culture? Because today, it's true to say that culture is everything. All eyes are on culture as the cause and the cure of everything. And let me give you some examples. And in fact, bullying is endemic in surgery, common in training and the surgical workplace, and central to the culture of surgery. This powerful generalization about the culture of surgery is made by the expert advisory group on discrimination, bullying, and sexual harassment that advised Rex in its report. And so Rex has therefore logically committed itself to working to make changes in three key areas, the first of which is cultural change and leadership. And the report, in fact, made reference to a culture of fear and reprisal and made it clear that its authors support the notion, which was put forward by Major General David Morrison to his personnel, that everyone is responsible for culture. And it is somewhat ironic that a culture of competition and perfection could have given rise to a culture of bullying. So where else has culture been invoked as the cause of harm and chaos? Well, was it a culture of every dollar counts at BP that led to the Deepwater Horizon disaster and the US's worst ever oil spill? Or was it lapses in character and culture that led to the 2014 Veterans Administration scandal in which clinical delays were alleged to have caused scores of deaths, as well as the 2008 Mid-Staffordshire scandal which showed pervasive clinical lapses in gaming of the system to meet targets? Or was it the club culture as elucidated in the Kennedy report that led to the Bristol children's heart surgery scandal. And I always feel conflicted about Bristol because I spent an amazing six weeks as a medical student in the Bristol Children's Hospital doing pediatric cardiology and James Wishart couldn't have been kinder or more welcoming. So I'm always a bit conflicted. Or was our Prime Minister correct to invoke that big cultural issues as being central to the recent behavior of the banks in which some, as he said, have taken advantage of our fellow Australians and the savings that they've spent a lifetime accumulating. So, if all those examples are true, is it reasonable that the Australian Institute of Company Directors should intend over 2016 to focus on boardroom culture by continuing to work with governance leaders to drive performance through culture and the AICD continues to believe that directors creating and nurturing the right culture or setting the right tone from the top are crucial to an organization's success. And in fact, Greg, Greg Medcraft thought, well, let's go one better. Why don't we up the ante and, and issue a veiled threat to move to extend the laws to enforce corporate culture if certain companies fail to lift their standards? So, Let's go and look at health and the culture and the role of culture in health. As far back as 1997, an issue of quality in healthcare was devoted to considerations of organizational change in healthcare, calling it the key to quality improvement. And in discussing such change, how such change can be managed, one of the authors asserted that cultural change needs to be wrought alongside structural reorganization and systems reform to bring about a culture in which excellence can flourish. And the Labour government was elected in 1997 and in the UK made quality the central reform issue in the NHS. Its strategy aimed to define appropriate quality standards, deliver healthcare congruent with those standards, monitor to ensure that uniformly high quality of care is achieved and it was in the delivery of healthcare that a consideration of organizational culture was seen as having the most to offer. 
And in articulating the strategy needed to deliver this new care, official documents stress the interlinking of three different strands, clinical governance, lifelong learning, professional self-regulation, and underpinning and binding each of these was the notion of cultural transformation as a primary driver to improve, deliver, and, and to, to, beg your pardon, to deliver improved quality of care. Specifically, achieving meaningful and sustainable quality improvements in the NHS requires a fundamental shift in culture to focus effort where it is needed and enable and empower those who work in the NHS to improve quality locally. So, what does, cultural changes did they desire? I thought I'd tabulate them, and I've only included those that are relevant at a clinician level. And it's interesting to note how they changed. So, professional judgment didn't any longer form the basis of practice. It became evidence-based. And control became audit and external verification. And performance became publicly available. And audit became mandatory. And accountability was now corporate and there was clinical governance and it was supposed to be transparent. And CPD became mandatory. And we moved our ethical basis from Hippocratic Oath and the patient first to a more corporate objective. And then you've naturally got to have a new moral fabric in which to work. So now we have new expectations that the physician is responsible not only to the individual patient, but to the population. And now we see the emergence of the team or the group or even the patient has taking responsibility. And to be credible and trusted, you need to base it on data and evidence. And again, suddenly, performance and accountability is taken over by governments and purchases and public and community groups. And the physician becomes accountable to organizations and external groups. And organizations exist to serve patients the community and physician interests. So you can see there was a massive cultural change. So an examination might well give the reader, or, the, or as we've seen here, you a bit of pause for thought as one recognizes how many of these changes have come to profoundly impact our current practice and our view of ourselves and of healthcare. So if culture has such an apparent, is such an apparent key ingredient, and really it's almost become part of the um, public uh, you know, uh, government policy, if it is such an apparent key ingredient for success or failure, are we able to define it? Is there a clear definition of organizational culture? And it's interesting <clears throat> to note the comments made by John Trefagan in the Harvard Business Review in his article entitled, Why Company Culture is a Misleading Term. Today, the idea that organizations have cultures is really questioned by the media, by corporate executives, or by the consultants who make a living helping organizations to improve their cultures. Organizational culture is assumed to be important to make sure that employees are happy and, pro and productivity is good. But at the same time, the concept the meaning and the function of culture really garners much thought. And when he asks business people to define culture, or even when he asks the students in his class on organizational culture to define it, it turns out to be difficult. I either get a simple definition, such as our oh, values of the group, or oh, interesting question, or I just get the, duh, the blank look. So the problem is, that while we use the term culture constantly, most of us give very little thought to what the term actually means and how it influences behavior and thought within organizations. So, he goes on in more detail to explain. In fact, anthropologists, the group of academics who first used the term in an analytical sense, have never really agreed on exactly what culture means. And in the 19th century, E.B. Tylor, that's not a typo, it's not it's Tyler, not, not Taylor, define culture as that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. And most of the definitions of culture used in books about organizational culture and values follow this Tylorian definition. So culture is the values, 
practices, beliefs, etc., of a group of people. In other words, culture is everything, which, is, which basically means it's nothing from an analytical perspective. Culture is everything. The only really useful in aspect of this definition is that culture involves groups and that those groups share something. Otherwise, as he says, it's pretty vague. And in a paper in the same Harvard Business Review, in the same journal, in 2013, Michael Watkins wrote, if you want to provoke a vigorous debate, start a conversation about organizational culture. While there is universal agreement that it exists, that it plays a crucial role in shaping the behavior in organizations, there is little consensus on what it actually is, never mind how it influences behavior and whether it is something leaders can change. This is a problem, he goes on to argue, because without a definition of culture, we cannot hope to understand its connections to other elements of the organization, such as structure and incentive systems, nor can we develop good approaches to analyzing, preserving, and transforming culture. If we can define what organizational culture is, it gives us a handle on how to diagnose problems and even to design and develop better cultures. And he received a massive amount of feedback. I think he used LinkedIn. And some of it he distilled down. And here are just a few examples of what people perceived as culture. It's a product of compensation. Uh, organizational culture is civilization in the workplace. It's an organization's immune system. It's a living organization, a living culture that can adapt to reality, and so on. He got a multitude of definitions and perceptions and conceptualizations of culture. And really at the core of the modernist approach is the view that organizational phenomena, including culture, structure, and performance, are concrete entities which can be systematically described and explained. And if, as this approach suggests, culture is something that an organization has, then it may be possible, may be possible to create, change, and manage culture in the pursuit of wider organizational objectives. But it's clear to me, looking at the examples cited above and in reading the massive amount of literature on, manage, on organizational culture, that it is all based on the possibly false assumption that cultures are an attribute of an organization and are open to manipulation. A postmodern perspective on organizational culture would not focus on it as a means of control. I've made it a bit more woolly. It would instead encourage dialogue on the nature and course of change among stakeholders, particularly those who have traditionally been disenfranchised or marginalized from such discussions. Now, in a recent discussion, in the, again, in the Harvard Business Review, which you could have gathered by now I subscribe to, written by Lorsch and McTague, suggests there's an emerging opinion, particularly among CEOs who've led major transformations within their organizations, that culture is not something you fix. Rather, it is, in their experience, cultural change is what you get after you've put new processes or structures in place to tackle tough business challenges like reworking an outdated strategy or business model. They all show in a range of settings that culture isn't a final destination, but that it morphs right along with the company's competitive environment and its objectives. So it gets a lot more complicated. And as John Trefagan goes on, the problem with the term culture is that it tends to essentialize groups. It simplistically represents in a particular, a particular group of people as a unified whole that share simple common values, ideas, practices, and belief. But the fact is, such groups really don't exist. And within any group characterized as having a culture, there are numerous contested opinions, beliefs, and behaviors. And people may align themselves to behave in a way that seems as though they bind to the expressed corporate values and culture, but this is just as likely to be a product of self-preservation as it is of actually believing in those values or identifying with some sloganized organizational culture. 
So, he says, we need to stop using the term culture to talk about what's going on in our organizations. By using the culture concept, we ossify the diverse, complex, and constantly changing social environment that is any organization. And as a result, it becomes easy to misinterpret or misunderstand the nature and influence of power, conflict, cooperation, and change in relation to both individual and group behaviors. Corporations and other organizations do not have cultures. They have philosophies and ideologies that form a process in which there is a constant discourse about the nature and expression of values, beliefs, practices, ideas, and goals. And this discourse happens in sales meetings, interactions with customers, board meetings, and even in the conversations around the water cooler. It is constantly moving. So, if defining and understanding our conceptualization of organizational culture is hard enough, then it's even more sobering to consider how complex the problem in health is when you try to explain the NHS. And here, just briefly for your contemplation, is a simple diagram of the NHS that we use to explain it to a Martian. And so it will be seen from that cartoon that it can be readily appreciated that the culture within an organization may be far from uniform or coherent and that looking for commonality might be less rewarding than an examination of differences. Some cultural attributes may be seen across an organization, others may be prominent only in some sections of that organization, and thus different cultures may emerge within occupational or professional groups. Hence, we have the emergence of subcultures. We might be a subculture. Some of these might be malleable, others resistant, so we might become a counterculture. And for all the influence in defining and assessing organizational culture, there is a crucial generic question. How does organizational culture impact on organizational success or performance? A simple causal relationship between cultural characteristics and success has not yet been demonstrated, unsurprisingly. Relationship is highly contingent on definitions of success and a wide range of other internal and external factors, and such evidence as exists is equivocal at best. And in their concluding remarks in their paper, Hugh Davies, writes, in the UK, the government's quality strategy emphasizes the importance of cultural transformation. And if such an approach is to bear fruit, a number of assumptions that are implicit in the approach must be verified as having some substance. Firstly, there must be such a thing as organizational culture. Secondly, the nature of this culture must have some bearing on clinical performance and healthcare quality. And thirdly, it should be possible to identify particular cultural attributes that are facilitative of performance. And finally, <clears throat> there must be some hope that interventions and management strategies can have a predictable impact on cultural attributes as a precursor to bring about performance improvements. At least at the very least, his paper demonstrates that these assumptions are far from trivial or self-evident. Indeed, empirical thinking illuminates contention rather than consensus. And this in turn suggests, and it certainly suggests to me, that a more sober assessment of the task of cultural transformation in healthcare is warranted. I'd like to share with you <clears throat> what I see as some other cultures that we encounter daily in our healthcare environment. So I'd like to offer to you that we have a number of emerging cultures. And the first of these is medical tailorism, not named after myself. And in fact, this amounts to the so-called Toyota's lean management. I've even done a two-week course in lean management through UniSA to try and understand it a bit more. And advocates of this lecture clinicians about Toyota's lean practices, arguing that patient care, patient care should, be followed, should follow standardized systems 
like those deployed in manufacturing automobiles. And the e-health record has become a key instrument for measuring the duration and standardizing the content of the doctor-patient relationship or interaction in pursuit of the Toyota's one best way. And the authors of a critique of Taylorism believe that the standardization uh, um, integral to Taylorism or the Toyota manufacturing process cannot be applied to the many vital aspects of medicine. And they argue that if patients were cars, well, we'd all be used cars of different years and model with different and often multiple problems, many of which have previously been repaired, we hope, by authorized mechanics. And moreover, those cars would all communicate in different languages, express individual preferences regarding when, how, and even whether they wanted to be fixed. And the inescapable truth of medicine is that patients are genetically, physiologically, psychologically, and culturally diverse. And in fact, instead of gaining happiness minutes, clinicians are increasingly experiencing dissatisfaction and burnout as they are subjected to the time pressures of Taylorism and scientific management in the name of efficiency. Here's my next culture. This is Michael Porter's value culture. And the underlying notion here is that healthcare is shifting focus from the volume of services delivered to the value created for patients with value defined as the outcomes achieved relative to the costs. And the argument goes that providers, payers, patient advocacy groups, and regulators can come together to create a process to agree on a minimum sufficient set of outcomes for each important medical condition. And you might note in a recent, again, a recent paper that Michael Porter wrote in the Harvard Business Review, that the fee-for-service system, the dominant payment model in the US and many other countries is now widely re recognized as perhaps the single biggest obstacle to improving healthcare delivery. And in fact, this is where we start to see bundled payments. The next emerging culture I'd like to dwell on briefly is the emerging culture of the choosing wisely culture. Perhaps the most visible effort so far to reduce inappropriate use of medical treatments and tests has been the Choosing Wisely campaign. And in this campaign, medical societies have identified tests, medications, and treatments that are used inappropriately. The success of such efforts, however, may be limited by the tendency of human beings to overestimate the effect of their actions. Choosing wisely may be an ambitious attempt to address the problems of overtreatment, but it is not realistic to think that any single solution will be effective. And the Choosing Wisely campaign has recently begun to be addressed by our college via the Safety and Quality Committee, and in a recent email seeking fellows input, the aim of the campaign was described as to promote a culture where inappropriate clinical interventions are avoided Improved care is the core objective and each recommendation should be evidence-based. Then there's patient-centered culture, which is, patient-centered culture is health care that is respectful of and responsive to the preferences, needs, and values of patients and consumers. The widely accepted dimensions of patient-centered care are respect, emotional support, physical comfort, information and communication, continuity and transition, care coordination, involvement of family and carers and access to care. And surveys measuring patients' experience of healthcare are typically based on these domains. And the phrase, nothing about me without me, is their guiding principle, and this phrase has been popularized by authors and regulators and is considered synonymous with efforts to advance a vision of patient-centered care. And so emerging out of the idea of patient-centered care, you get the notion that you can create a culture of caring with kindness. And in many instances, you can try and force that down from the top to make people care with kindness. Uh, and this comes from um, South Australia. And the most central recurring tenet in all the initiatives explored when developing the framework is the concept of person-centered care. And if this ideal is achieved, it is reasonable to expect that the ensuing workplace culture would reflect core values that align with caring with kindness. So the idea that we can create a culture of caring with kindness. 
Then there's this one, the culture of greed. Now, there's been an attempt to foster the notion that the medical specialists in Australia have a common culture of greed and that the sustainability of healthcare in Australia is under threat as a result of this. This so-called culture manifests itself in unreasonable out-of-pocket expenses and bill shock. And of course, offering to change the culture are the private health insurers who seek to increase their stake in the provision of healthcare, claiming that they're able to make savings of $100 billion over 10 years with no change in the standard of care. And the profession is under constant barrage of negative press with no apparent end in sight as the culture of the Medicare rebate freeze continues. And here's the next one. Rax's idea of building a culture of respect and collaboration in surgical practice and education. And this is one of the cornerstones of the Rax action plan to address bullying and discrimination and sexual harassment in their profession. It's a very powerful example of an organization that embraces the idea that culture is an item that is possessed and can be altered to achieve an outcome. As an anaesthetist or as anaesthetists, we're at risk of harm from the culture of bullying that appears endemic both to surgery and I might add to nursing. And then I want to dwell briefly on this one, which I believe is one of the most insidious and destructive cultures. It's a bit wordy, but it's worth contemplating. And this is the culture of submerging or hiding the truth that trade-offs between quality and cost are embedded in, in budget constraints. And I would argue this is one of the most destructive, pervasive and prevalent cultures to which we are currently subjected. And in discussing the crisis in the VA in 2014, the prevailing narrative was one of breakdowns of character and culture, dishonesty, callousness, ineptitude, and in the same way, the Mid-Staffordshire scandal resulted in politicians blaming individual perpetrators and one another for the prevailing, and the prevailing narrative highlighted lapses in character and culture. However, closer scrutiny reveals another parallel with important implications for cost control efforts. In both cases, performance standards often proved incompatible with resource constraints. Yet the gap between the two remained unmentionable amid pressure to make care both better and cheaper. Outbreaks of dishonesty resulted as personnel tried to finesse failure with fakery, and the fakery was discovered and the perpetrators were punished. But the truth that trade-offs between quality and cost were embedded in budget constraints remained submerged. We need to dispel the myth that we can control costs without foregoing therapeutic benefit. This is being belied by mounting evidence. An open discussion of how to make real cost quality trade-offs is essential to stopping the progression from impossibility to the breakdown of professionalism and compassion, a progression that simply leads to scandal. So how are we to respond to the many cultural challenges above and the challenge of culture as either an attribute that we have or the sum of what we are. So recognizing that there is more to organizational culture than we might have realized and being able to identify where culture and cultural change might be being used to manipulate us are a pretty good first step. Taking time to ponder, and in the new word, to reflect. What our key assumptions or taken for granted views of the world are, and how they are being altered and challenged is insightful. Restating and articulating the values that form the basic foundation for our making judgments and distinguishing right from wrong behavior is a crucial and ongoing process. We need to examine the artifacts that are the physical and behavioral manifestations of our culture, which gives us useful clues to see how we are adapting and evolving. And I thought we might just try to center our thinking by just revisiting the following. And I was reminded of this when it was put up at the AMA National Conference not very long ago. It's useful just to briefly go through it. 
that we do solemnly pledge to consecrate our life to the service of humanity, to practice our profession with conscience and dignity, to make the health of the patient our first consideration, to maintain the utmost respect for human life, and to not make use of the medical knowledge we have to violate human rights and civil liberties even when under threat. I'll give you just a moment to realize and to contemplate that these are many of the things that we've pledged ourselves to undertake. And whilst at the same time, I would also argue that it is in our associating in this way via the mechanisms of our society that we gain strength and determine our culture. And I've quoted it a number of times to various people, but it is a powerful encouragement to consider the words of Alexis de, de, de Tocqueville, French, difficult, in his, in his book entitled Democracy in America, written a number of years ago, but what political power would ever be in a state to suffice for the innumerable multitude of small undertakings that American citizens execute with the aid of associations? The morality and intelligence of a democratic people would risk no fewer dangers than its business and its industry if the government came to take the place of associations everywhere. Sentiments and human ideas renew themselves, the heart is enlarged, and the human mind is developed only by the reciprocal action of men, and I might add, it was a long time ago, of women upon one another. And I say amen to that. So the challenge for us as a specialty is to determine whether we buy in to the notion of culture as something we own or can identify and hence manipulate. If we do, then we need to decide what particular cultural characteristics we might most espouse to have. Say, for example, a culture of safety and quality or a, patient, a culture of patient-centeredness. And then we need to identify what tools or processes we might have at our disposal to achieve our desired culture. What we want to avoid is falling into the category of risk-averse. A risk-averse culture which is likely to be an obstacle to any innovation. The best and the hardest work, according to Pixar's president, Ed Catmull, is done in the spirit of adventure and, challenges, and challenge. Mistakes will be made. We need to regard mistakes not as a necessary evil, but as the inevitable consequence of doing something new, and we need to rigorously extract value from failure. And as a final word, I would ask you to consider the words of Dr. Harold Griffiths, written in tribute to Francis McMeachin. And I think it's, very worth, it's worth briefly contemplating the profound impact that Francis McMeachin had on Jeffrey Kay. And it was really at, largely at the urging of McMeachin that Kay embarked on his many activities and tried as hard as he did. And, and Harold Griffiths said, friendliness, was the keynote of all his activities. He built up the foundation of cooperation, enthusiasm, and friendship, which is present more strongly in the specialty of anesthesiology than in any other medical group. So I would say to you that maybe in all the complexity and challenge of our professional world, we should foster a simple culture of friendliness and cooperation. Thank you. Um, before you go, Guy, um, we do have a gift for all our speakers, uh, and you get a paperweight. So that Whilst these things may weigh heavily on your mind, the paperweight will stop the papers from flying away. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much again, Guy Christa Taylor. Uh, just to, another couple of housekeeping uh, comments. Um, there is a return bus transfer which will be available today for delegates attending workshop 24 at the Royal Australian College of Surgeons. The bus will depart from the convention centre entrance at 10.15 a.m. And I'd now like to introduce uh, Professor Colin Royce as the chairperson of the next session.
Thank you very much, David. Um, just before we introduce the next, there is a little bit of housekeeping. Um, now, for those who have done the simulator workshops, that's the um, vascular access and the uh, transthoracic, the equipment will be available in room 218 until the end of today only. It is actually packing up at the end of today, so it will not be available tomorrow. So those who wish to get their cases done, please make the effort today. Um, delegates attending the gala dinner tonight will need to confirm your table allocations by 12 p.m. today at the registration desk. There is a big board with a place for you to put your sticky uh, with your name on it to confirm that. Um, there is an ASA research prize presentation at 2.30 p.m. In, in this room, uh, followed by the ASA general meeting, and we'd encourage all of you to please attend both the prize uh, uh, announcement and session as well as the AGM. That's very important for our society to get as many people in the audience to discuss the business matters of the ASA. Uh, again, if there are any late changes, you'll see them posted on the electronic screen outside the exhibition entrance. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next session. And again, keeping in the, one of our two major themes of perioperative medicine and clinical ultrasound, um, our Australian invited speaker uh, is, being, is going to give a plenary on um, ultrasound for everyone, why, when, and how we get there. And this is going to be delivered by uh, David Canty, who is well known to many of you, and has actually been one of the pioneers in this area of um, showing that anaesthetists can actually perform bedside echo and bedside other uses of clinical ultrasound, which will radically change the way we view that patient and how we um, are flawed sometimes by what we see and how it changes how we think, how we behave and how we manage our patients. And it really is, um, I think if, if I put my crystal ball as in a decade we won't even be talking about this, it'll just be part of what we do. Now David Canty uh, did his PhD actually with me at the University of Melbourne um, and it was mainly based around this whole area. But he's gone on. He's now a senior lecturer at the Department of Surgery, University of Melbourne and he's an adjunct associate professor at uh, Monash University and he's a cardiac anaesthetist both in uh, Royal Melbourne and at Monash. But what he's really, um, I think, inspired and, and contributed in recent years is that around the whole concept of simulation. And I was quite a sceptic of simulation, um, but in fact Dave uh, convinced me that, hey, this is a great way for people to get started. And it's scalable. And that's one of the challenges we'll be facing, I'm sure Dave will cover this, is how do we lift up the herd? How do we get the whole herd trained easily, efficiently? And in fact, simulation may be one of those pathways. So a great contribution by Dave in helping develop these areas. And I look very much forward to hearing his talk about ultrasound for everyone. When, why, and how to get there. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Colin. If we could just um, darken the lights for a sec. Thanks, and turn up the sound.
like to thank the organisers um, for this um, humble appointment. It's a real um, honour. And I've really looking, been looking forward to this talk. When I first um, went on the internet to look for the uh, schedule for this meeting, I was a bit confused. Um, I found this, an ultrasound meeting. Um, I couldn't see my talk anywhere on there, so I kept looking, and I found this. When I did find the, um, the schedule, again, I realised it was another ultrasound meeting. Nearly a third of the lectures are on ultrasound. It's fantastic. So this um, emphasises my first point. Um, ultrasound is changing our practice. Could I just briefly have a quick show of hands? Who uses the ultrasound in their practice? Raise your hands. Excellent, that's, that's pretty impressive. That's what I thought. But before I, better, um, before I continue on, I better just first also ask, are there any cardiologists in the audience? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to tone down my, uh, my, my talk then. Um, I've got a couple of disclosures. I am employed and paid money to research and teach ultrasound, um, but I'm not paid any money from the industry. Um, that's not to say that I won't accept money, if it's offered, thanks. Um, and here's, I'd like to start with a quote, one of my favourite quotes from an Indian saint philosopher. A new idea is first condemned as ridiculous and then dismissed as trivial until finally it becomes what everybody knows. This is um, the top to ultrasound. This is one that I made up. It makes sense to be able to see what you're doing. If you were a patient, would you prefer to have your procedure or your diagnosis be made oops, sorry, by someone using the landmark or blind techniques with a stethoscope or an x-ray? Or would you prefer to have someone with their glasses on? I think I'd rather have my glasses on. See what you can do. Because ultrasound are there our new eyes into the body and they allow us to produce much higher quality medicine and anaesthesia. So I'm going to take you through a little journey now. Ultrasound, the when, why, and how do I get there? First of all, we'll start with when. A little bit of history and a bit of culture. It all started back in the 1700s with echo reflection, where the bats were able to locate their food and navigate. Then a couple of scientists, Pierre and Jacques Curie in 88, 1888, discovered that if to form crystals, you could create an electric current. This is where it all started. War has triggered many medical advances, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, ultrasound is no exception. But it was not until 1954 that Dr. Edler and Hertz first were able to see the heart. And Dr. Redler is actually now known as the father of ultrasound. It didn't take long for this to be uptaken into other medical specialties. Interestingly, in neurosurgery, you use it to detect midline shift with space-occupying lesions. It quickly went to obstetrics and it rapidly changed that field of medicine as well. But Fagenbaum, in 68, is, now, is known as the father of echocardiography. He, he really put in a life's work into developing this field, which developed very rapidly, much faster than many other medical imaging modes at, at that, in those days. But it wasn't until 1980 that ultrasound finally got to the operating theatre. The cardiac surgeons were able to actually visualise coronary artery flow during the surgery. And very quickly after, they attached the um, ultrasound transducer to the end of a gastroscope and transesophageal echo was born, transforming cardiac surgery. And then in, it wasn't until the turn of the century we got these lovely 3D pictures where we were able to actually see 3D pictures of things inside the body. Here's a nice example of um, a blind new mother who hasn't had her baby yet. And due to the um, technology of 3D echo and 3D printing, she's actually able to feel her, her newborn before it's born. It was Cahalan 
probably the most famous um, Anissa Sereco back in 84 in San Francisco. He um, um, took over the toe probe and wielded it in cardiac surgery. And it was one of the first to publicise its fantastic use as a hemodynamic monitor. It seemed to, it seemed to surpass our, our other um, monitors at the time. It gave, it gave them a lot of surprises and a lot of successes. And then, interestingly enough, one of our invited speakers to this conference, Professor Stan Shernan, learned it from Cahalan in Boston in 1988. And by, by serendipity, there were two visiting Melbourne and Anesitas there at the time, and they, they brought it back to Melbourne. Well, where did transthoracic echo come? Well, it didn't take long to realise that transthoracic pictures are just upside down transesophageal echo pictures. However, you don't need to ram a great big um, thing down the throat. So you don't need an anaesthetic. And so it's quicker to learn, non-invasive. And here was the birth of transthoracic anaesthesia. Well, we got away with transesophageal echo from cardiology, but transthoracic echo seemed to be one step too far. And the turf wars began in 1990. It was led initially by emergency medicine, followed by intensive care and then anaesthesia. It was a bloody battle and it was very, um, there were lots of casualties. Emerging from the, from the fight came two prominent warriors, the Royce brothers, <coughs> Colin and Aesodus and his brother Alistair. Melbourne in 1995, they brought transesophageal echo to the Royal Melbourne Hospital with some help from their colleagues. However, Something special about this team, they actually decided to use science and education to actually validate its excuse. And they used um, science and logic. And then they came to the front of the charge. They, they had the vision to see that transthoracic echo was the way to go, because everybody could use it. We could take this fantastic um, monitor that we had in the cardiac surgery and apply it to almost every field of medicine. So using science, he, he started enlisting PhD students amongst one of those as myself. And when the um, cardiovascular anesthesiologists in the US were doing peacekeeping talks with the cardiologists in North America, Colin and Alistair were arming the masses with education. They realised that this was the key. At the time, there was no education. There was a couple of textbooks. And so they went about and they devised online learning. It went from um, transesophageal echo to point of care workshops, vascular access, regional ultrasound, they developed the heart scan, transthoracic echo, and then, and then um, realising this, the, this was the more popular area to go, became a certificate in clinical ultrasound. But it wasn't until 2011 that perhaps victory had, had arrived. The cardiologists um, had admitted defeat transthoracic and echo help cardiography was actually a valid tool for other specialties other than cardiologists and radiologists. And point of care ultrasound was, um, was there. The concept was take the machine to the bedside and use it when you need it, not having to wait for a third party provider. So the treating doctor actually uses it during their um, initial assessment, guiding accurate and uh, accurate decision making. The usual history examination conferred by um, investigations was flipped upside down. We were getting the definitive diagnosis right at the start, saving us time, getting the um, diagnosis correct first go, and obviously improving the patient. Well, this has gone on. Um, the Royce organisation's got bigger, and it's um, spreading overseas. And the final victory came shortly after, 2013, another landmark paper in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography, where focused cardiac ultrasound was actually defined by the, by the American Society of Echo. And it, and it was actually, um, it was, was recognised that it could be used by other, other medical specialties. To me, there seems to be three main uh, factors that have enabled this to work. Technology and equipment, Realisation that you can actually do it and uh, getting along with um, the, the current experts, cardiology and radiology. 
equipment has um, been a massive change. But the biggest one has been portability for point of care ultrasound. We can get the machine to the patient. The other thing is realisation that, that you can do it. Well, in 2005, Cobalt and colleagues proved that a medical student with brief training with an echo can outperform a cardiologist with a stethoscope. So if the medical students can do it after a brief training, then so can we. The other thing that you, we need to get along, we need to actually um, have, um, get past those forces that are stopping. I've, I've had a couple of tips during my time. I've been able to avoid, um, avoid the turf wars. It's to explain to them that focused cardiac ultrasound is complementary and not competitive with diagnostic ultrasound. The other one that you can try is that screening results in, actually results in more referrals for diagnostic ultrasound. And so don't worry, we're not going to take away all, all the money. The other thing, as I've found, is if you involve them in, in your ultrasound practice, research and education really helps. If that fails, you can hold up the licence to practice. Um, we're actually very lucky that our anaesthetic college is, um, in includes the scope of practice of focused transverse at ECHO, and I'll get to that a bit later. The intensive college has also now made it mandate mandatory for their basic training, and it's probably going to follow in emergency medicine. So ECHO cardiography. In the background, we've also been going in the, on the behind the scenes, abdominal ultrasound vascular ultrasound, regional anaesthesia, we're all contributing to this huge tsunami of, of um, ultrasound spreading around the world. And it goes on, lung ultrasound, DVT, etc. and there's, there's more. <laughs> the ultrasound revolution is here, and so is my second favourite quote. An invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. Maybe we, could, we should call it ultrasound disruption, as we were pointed out to by Professor Cernan on Sunday. OK, there's a little bit of history behind us. Now, why? How is ultrasound useful? Why do we, why do we want to do it? Why do we want to do it? Well, what's the evidence? Well, first of all, there was transesophageal echo in cardiac surgery. Although it, it rapidly took hold, we only have prospective observational studies or audit evidence, level B2 evidence, suggestive literature. There's no comparative studies, no randomised trials. So scientists really wouldn't agree that it's, um, that it's definitely the way to go. However, there was consistent findings of one in 10 patients where the, the intraoperative TOE actually changed the operative diagnosis and the management. In, in, in cardiac surgery, this is a big change, and so it's become standard of care. It was then realised that transesophageal echo was a, was a fan, superior, far superior hemodynamic monitor from the pulmonary artery catheter and the others. And so it was adopted in non-cardiac um, surgery and also in sick patients in intensive care as a, as a monitor and a diagnostic monitor. But again, a lot more research, but still only observational studies. Category B2 evidence. However, look at the change. One half of the patients, it actually significantly changed their diagnosis. Most of these are, 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 um, are to answer a question in persistent shock. So you've got sick patients and, these, and this transesophageal echo significantly changed, changed the hemodynamic management, whether they get fluids, inotropes, um, or even surgery. What about outcome? We'll get there soon. Transthoracic echo came next, and anaesthesia in critical care. Where's the evidence for this? Again, prospective observational studies. There's been a couple of um, small randomised studies, but one, but one of them was only retrospective, and they're both pilots. But still, look at those numbers, 50% change in management. In my, in my PhD, um, at the time, the only report that I'd seen of transthoracic echo being used in anaesthesia was a, was a letter to the editor by, um, by Dr. Hadzik saying, um, claiming that it's useful in the preoperative clinic. 
when I, when I finished, it was pretty much being taught all around the world. But it could be done as a point of care test by the bedside to help guide him, not, not only hemodynamic management, but also post-operative care and whether to proceed or not with surgery. The principal thing, the shift that it created, was unlike TOE, it could be done before surgery, allowing earlier accurate diagnosis, changing our treatment from reactive, from shock and hypotension or cardiac arrest, to more proactive. Everybody knows that prevention is much better than the cure. So we had a win-win scenario. So anyway, we scanned all, all of these uh, sick patients coming to the pre-op clinic for the uh, major cardiac surgery, non-cardiac surgery. We found there was a small proportion of them. The transthoracic echo was a it changed what we thought. It was a surprise. One in five patients had picked up a significant pathology. And I'm talking um, significant aortic stenosis, right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, you know, serious business. This was allowed, uh, allowed us to, to perhaps avoid a complication or even a death. We don't have evidence for that, but we do have evidence that, in, that it changed the management plan by, the, by those anaesthetists that were managing the patient. But a surprise, even a greater number of patients had actually reassured the anaesthetist, avoiding a, a delay or cancellation in surgery, avoiding the unnecessary use, perhaps, of invasive treatment in ICU or HDU. It enabled us to triage um, the, the best care to where it belongs, which what one would think should save money, however, it hasn't been fully investigated yet. We did the same thing in emergency surgery at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. This time, instead of a single echo operator, we tried a team of operators to see if that was, um, if that was feasible, and it was. This way, we found almost the same, same result, although this time the patients were a bit sicker, and so we had more step up in care and less step down in care. But still about the same change in care, 50% of patients. Well, what about outcome? We've got a lot of observational evidence that it changes what we do, but does it really make a difference? Well, a lot of these patients that we studied, especially in the emergency setting, had fractured hip surgery. I'm not sure if you're aware, you probably are aware, but these are one of the highest risk surgery populations. And the, the preoperative echo changed the management even greater in, in this cohort. So we studied these separately. We did a retrospective um, study, echo off one and we actually found a greater survival in the patients that had a preoperative echo compared to randomised um, retrospective controls. So this is an association. So it, it was perhaps a sniff that actually um, echo may, may actually change the outcome. We haven't done a, there hasn't been yet a big outcome randomised trial yet. We estimate it requires um, about a thousand patients, quite a lot of money. We've done a couple of pilot studies. One of them we looked at the, uh, to, to see whether it improved post-operative quality of recovery. Unfortunately, the trial was stopped early because the, um, the post-operative quality of recovery tool required cognition, and these patients, a third of them, had um, cognitive impairment, so it had to be stopped early. So we didn't find any any difference. So we're back to the mortality. So we've started, um, we've started again. We're looking at mortality outcome. We want to know, does preoperative FCU or focused cardiac ultrasound improve the composite outcome of death, renal failure and major cardiac events one month after surgery? If it does, how does it do this? And if so, is it cost effective? We've started the um, study um, and we're recruiting about, on average about two patients a week with an increasing number of centres taking part. We hope to have some answers by next year. Well, echocardiography is great. It changes what we do in 50%. But what about the other 50%? Hang on, if you've got a breathless patient and you do an echo on them and it's normal, then the patient's still breathless and you haven't, you're not, not sure what the answer is. It seems to be something missing. Perhaps the lungs could be the other 50%. Where's the evidence for this? Well, lung ultrasound has actually had the most meteoric rise out of all, perhaps out of all the ultrasound modalities. It enables us to diagnose fluid effusion, consolidation, 
pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, and many more. It was, it was first thought to be the enemy of ultrasound air. However, in 2008, in a, in a landmark paper by Daniel Lichtenstein in France, he showed that in, over, in 200 patients that presented to intensive care with respiratory failure, lung, bedside lung ultrasound was as accurate or very close to accuracy to, to CT in diagnosing these conditions. Recently, I was at a meeting in Bangalore, India, and a cardiologist fellow came up to me and he said one of his friends wanted to do a PhD, and he wanted to do it in lung ultrasound. Unfortunately, he, his idea was re rejected by the academic board. The academic board, do you know what they said? They said, everybody knows that you can't scan the lungs because air is in the lungs. So he had to choose something else. Ridiculous. It's changed. So our, our group's been, we've been very interested in this area. And we've found, um, the, we've tested it in a few scenarios after cardiac surgery, using it as a, as a repeated monitor. We found that it was useful um, for stepping up and stepping down care, mostly in diagnosing pleural effusions. But there were a few patients where it picked up pneumothorax, consolidation and pulmonary edema. We also, um, we also have repeated this, the work in a medical ICU, Dr. Dr. Kavi Haji from Frankston. She's actually an expert lung, lung sonographer and that may be why she's picked up a larger number of pathology. But she's also, well, she's also found the similar findings that it uh, actually changes management in 50%. Maybe that's the missing 50%. More recently, we've tested lung ultrasound in, in the awake ward patients coming for cardiac and thoracic surgery. And we, we compared it with the stethoscope and with the X-ray. And you can see the X-ray and the um, clinical examination didn't fare very well. Lung ultrasound was much more superior. The, one of the testaments to the rapid growth in, in lung ultrasound is shown in, in a survey that we, we, we conducted in 2012 at, at clinicians at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. One in four um, were aware of lung ultrasound and had used it before. We repeated the, the survey again last year in, in Australasian intensive care units, 50% out surpassing transesophageal echo and even transthoracic echo. What about vascular access? <clears throat> well, everybody knows that in, in, inserting central lines and arterial lines has, has an associated morbidity and occasionally mortality. Well, it's actually one of the, one of the most studied areas of ultrasound me, uh, medicine and there's the most evidence, 30, over 30 randomised controlled studies. And in this um, recommendations from the American Society of Echo and the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, they actually um, they recommend routine use of ultrasound in real time whenever possible when inserting the internal jugular line or the radial artery. Just a quick show of hands, anyone who's used ultrasound to put in, put in a central line, raise your hand. Keep your hand up if you use ultrasound routinely. It's a lot of you, isn't it? That's good. Well done. <laughs> um, and it, it, back in 2002, um, Great Britain were actually the first to get onto this, and the National Institute of Clinical Excellence um, recommended routine use. In a, in a single institution, in a, in a nice before and after study, they showed a complication rate was reduced by an amazing 50%. I'm surprised this hasn't, um, hasn't come to other countries, but I'm sure it's not far away. Well, what about regional anaesthesia? Where's the evidence for this? Again, this has actually been pretty well studied, again by some um, prominent Aust um, Australians. And consistently, it shows more efficiency than landmark or standard techniques. Um, it appears to, have, appears to have less serious complications, or at least it's surrogate markers for complications. However, as yet, better analgesia has not been demonstrated. However, there's no doubt that ultrasound has led to a significant and rapid advancement in the acute and chronic pain specialties. It now makes the impossible possible. Nerves that were not being able to be found before can now be found and blocked. 
Well, there's been a massive proliferation in ultrasound guided procedures. There's almost not one body cavity or organ or a body orifice that cannot be achieved by an ultrasound and a needle. We won't go there. Well, this is the tip of the iceberg, anaesthesia and critical care. We're important, but there's, there, are, there are many others. Recently, recently one of our students um, demonstrated the use of routine fo focus cardiac ultrasound screening in general practice. And again, we found the same finding. One in five patients picked up an undiagnosed cardiac pathology. Most of these were aortic stenosis and cardiac failure, completely missed or not suspected by the, um, by the general practitioner. But we're getting more and more, the, the bulk of our students now coming to the, to the getting started courses are actually residents, interns, and even getting some nurses. I heard the other day that our care flight team and um, paramedics have little portable ultrasound machines. Ultrasound for everyone, we're nearly we're getting there. Okay, if I haven't convinced you that, that it's, um, it's everyone, um, you can leave now. <laughs> for those, those, those of you who want to learn, you can stay. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go through how do, how do, how do I think we're going to get there. Well, there's no excuse now to say that I, can't, I couldn't get the equipment, so I couldn't do the block or I couldn't, um, couldn't do the echo. There's equipment everywhere. Some people carry them around. But the surgeon's waiting. It does take time to learn. And um, when people are waiting for you, it's, it really puts the pressure on. But with any new um, uh, technology, uh, medical innovations are the, are the same. There's the early innovators. That, that there's a long time to lag, lag for the early adopters. And even the early majority can take, can take some up to five years. The late majority, skeptics and laggards. So I, th I think, like most things, you either need a carrot to entice people or a stick. So we'll go through these. The innovators and early adopters are easy. They respond to the carrot. Research publications, a lot of them are doing research and they're actually doing it already. But the early adopters, they, they read journals, they go to conferences, they like to do the courses, they try new things. The carrot seems to work quite well. The early and late majority, they seem to need the stick. College requirements, CPD, certification, seems to work in this, in this category. Skeptics in laggards need something else, I'm afraid. Textbooks are the way we all grew up with learning. However, there's so many books now. And the ultrasound is such a huge area, where, where do we start? If you, wanted a, if you wanted a textbook on every ultrasound guided procedure or diagnosis, you'd fill a house. Some of them come with DVDs, but um, I don't even have a DVD player anymore. The internet is a, fa it's a fantastic resource. It's at your fingertips, it's there all the time. But again, it's, it's huge and it's unregulated and it's hard to know where to start. Exams, the stick, this has worked for cardiac anaesthetists in North America and around the world, where they've actually been told they have to, uh, they have to complete an exam in order to practice cardiac anaesthesia, TOE, during cardiac surgery. The problem with this approach is that they don't actually tell you how to get there. They just tell you what you have to do. They just tell you whether you pass or not. And the, the, the other problem initially was that they set the bar very high. They made it diagnostic level. You had to be as good as, a, as an echocardiologist to be able to pass the exam, often taking one, two, maybe even three years of training. They didn't realise that, the, that people start, with, um, start at the beginning, the learners, and they were, that they were afraid that if they did a small or, or limited study that they would be criticised by, by a um, diagnostic facility for, not, for, for missing something. But there's... But everybody knows you have to start at the beginning and work your way up. Luckily, our college had the, had the foresight and some innovators to update the transesophageal echo training guidelines back in 2013. 
we added in um, the transthoracic echo, both um, diagnostic and goal focus level. So it's now within our scope of practice. Just this year, the Intensive Care College has, has mandated if, you, if you're doing um, training in intensive care, you must, you must do 30 focused cardiac ultrasound cases and do a, do a course. And emergency medicine is following. But a lot of us believe that it really should be done in medical school. It's already happening. And it makes sense. Because when you're embarking on specialist training, often you've got family, you're busy, you've got, already got an extremely packed curriculum. How can, you, how can you pack in anything more? Ultrasound is, is um, fantastic, but it is, does require time and, and, and a commitment. So it makes sense to do it when you're starting off, when you're absorbing all the knowledge. And we showed this in a recent um, uh, survey. The biggest barriers to, um, to learning, up, practicing ultrasound was inadequate training and time. So it should be done in medical school. The other thing that we found after, after teaching um, point of care ultrasound for, for, for about a decade is that when there's a huge demand, the apprenticeship model fails. The apprenticeship model fail, relies closely on close supervision of an expert trainer. It requires patience. If, you, if you're learning sort of a procedure, then they actually need to have the procedure. So there's a finite number of, um, of, of access availability. So it's impossible to teach everybody quickly. Simulators may be the key because they allow us to learn to how to um, acquire the images, but now they also contain lots of complex pathology. So they enable us to learn also how to interpret the images and how to practice reporting in our own time. So I think the mixture of um, internet courses and, and the simulators together might be a scalable solution. And I'll take you through this, how this works. E-learning, structured on the internet, replaces the instructor. It flips the classroom upside down. Instead of lots and lots of didactic hours of didactic classroom lectures, you do it in your own time, on the bus, on the aeroplane, on the toilet. The simulator replaces human models. You don't need to have um, models coming to workshops. It re replaces patients. You don't have to go to a hospital. You don't, you don't have to expose patients to, to learning. You don't have to put a transesophageal echo down, there, down their throat. You don't have to insert a needle into them. You can do it on the simulator. It can be self-directed. It can be done in your own time. So this answers the problem of the time pressure. The surgeon's waiting. I've got another exam to do. Um, I've got baby, babies at home, need a holiday. You can do it in your own time when you've got some spare, um, spare time. This allows you to scale up the teaching to meet the demand of the masses. And, we, and we've found that it seems to work. The transthoracic echo, I'll go through an example. We think about 20 to 30 hours of online learning is enough to get started. It needs to be interactive. They need to have some case studies to practice, so they're actually practicing interpretation. And what the idea here is, is that, they be, is that they get the knowledge base before they start getting pictures. And it needs to be assessed. You need to make sure it's been absorbed. Otherwise, people can just say they've, that they've done it and they haven't done it, and, they, and they'll waste everybody's time. So when they get to the practical learning period time, there's no questions about what's aortic stenosis, how do I measure this, how do I measure that. They know it all and they can focus 100% of their time and energy on, on the practical skills, on the simulators. So now the workshops have gone from a week down to a weekend, down to three hours. Because all, the, all you really have to show them is how to turn the simulator on, how to use it, and how to, how to teach themselves. You don't need to have a, a venue, you don't have to have five or six instructors, you don't need catering, no accommodation, flights, you can just, all you need is three hours during, during a time that suits you, and a small group. The next bit's the, um, the bit where you really learn how to, how to get the pictures. You can sit quietly with the simulator and work yourself through how to get the pictures. It all starts to make sense. You haven't got noisy monitors, the phone's not ringing, you haven't got a surgeon telling you to hurry up. You haven't got a patient that wants to, wants to go. You can sit there in your own time 
and you can work yourself, work your way through and do the learning. But the most important key that we haven't quite answered yet is how to put it all together. How to actually take the new skills and do it, do it in, in, in the real thing. We think that this can be done with the stick method where you, where you include that they have to do um, a certain number of cases on patients to complete the course. We're actually researching this at the moment. So we provide an electronic logbook of cases and when they, when they record their images they can actually upload it to the cloud and have a supervisor look at them in their own time. So that way, that way you get feedback on the pictures without, without having to have a, have a supervisor there with you. This might be, might be the way of getting around the problem. We've had some really good feedback with the trans um, simulator system and it's um, showing the evidence that it could be scalable because it's um, developing some other courses and it's, and it's already spreading to some other sites. This is, this is in only two years. Okay, well what about next? Where do we go? Peri-arrest. Cardiac life support. It's either assess the rhythm, you either shock or you don't, or you use CPR, or you give up. Well, there's more to it. We think the ultrasound might be involved here because it's been shown now that one in every, one in every five times the rhythm strip is actually wrong. If you put an echo probe on, you might detect fine VF or, or even a bradycardia with a or um, um, slow, slow rhythm. So we might see instead of fetching the defibrillator, it will be fetched the defibrillator and the ultrasound machine. But the supermarket next to the, um, the paddles could be a little portable machine, ultrasound machine. It's also good for, uh, for the four H's and the four T's. We can detect hypovolemia, tamponade, PE, MI, tension pneumothorax. We can also help us perform life-saving procedures quickly and more, more efficiently. This is here, here and now. Here's a, here's a case example, recent one. Patient with severe hematemesis comes to the operating theatre because the hemodynamically unstable. They're given the GA in the operating room. Cardiac arrest. The rhythm strip shows VT, irregular rhythm. The plan is to do CPR and defibrillation. However, an anaesthetist is called in to help put an arterial line in under ultrasound. And it so happens they just did the peri-arrest course the day before. And they say, hang on, we'll put the ultrasound probe on and just check. Bradycardia and severe hypovolemia. So let's cancel the deep defibrillation and give some adrenaline and fluids and the patient bounced back. Fantastic. What else? What's near? Ultrasound guided microsurgery. There are now little um, scalpels that can fit inside a small incision and can be seen under ultrasound. Unfortunately, I don't have any ultrasound pictures of these, but it's, but it's an emerging field. We can do um, carpal tunnel release, plantar fascia, fasciotomies. Here's a video of the ultrasound knife. This can be seen, seen under ultrasound vision. We've seen um, mobile transducers that can, um, that can Wi-Fi images to your smartphone. What about a smartphone that is a probe? Virtual reality has just, has just come in the mainstream. We may be able to put the virtual reality goggles on and do some training. We could see our patient, assess them clinically, do the ultrasound, get the diagnosis, and then get our instruments and perform the ultrasound guided procedure. All in our own time. Oh, could we please have some sound? Fuck. Are there any medical supplies on this thing? This way. These things are from the Dark Ages. Uh, oh, uh, I'm pretty sure this is a protoplaser. Uh, it stop the internal hemorrhaging. At least that's my hope. The miserable have no other medicine but only hope. Death's door is quoting Shakespeare. 
invisible um, Wi-Fi surgery. So in conclusion, ultrasound is disrupting medicine. It's enabling us to do ultrasound assisted clinical examination, ultrasound guided procedures, and it's becoming a component of medical training and it's changing the way that we do ultrasound for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for uh, such an inspiring talk. And uh, I do believe in a decade from now, um, we'll only be doing workshops probably to upscale the laggers because everyone else will be on board. And it's been an incredible journey for me personally, this whole ultrasound game, and I'm sure for many people in this audience. And ultimately, it's all about putting our patients first, as uh, Guy alluded to this morning. So. We'll uh, break for morning tea now. We've got a few extra minutes to catch that coffee. And again, if I could get you to thank both our speakers this morning. <laughs>